Today I want to share with you how to make Instant Pot Turkey Bone Broth that gels every time. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient dense foods like bone broth, ferments, sourdough and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. If you made a turkey for Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner and now you've got the bones left over and some of the scraps and the skin and so on and so forth, this is the perfect time to make turkey bone broth. Now those of you who have been with me for a while know that I love to make bone broth in the slow cooker, but if you're in a rush, the Instant Pot is terrific. But there are a few tips that you need to be aware of when you make bone broth in the Instant Pot so that it does gel. And the reason that you want your bone broth to gel, to be a gelatinous bone broth, is because the gelatin is very nutritious. It's rich in protein and it's very soothing to our gut, our intestinal linings. And what exactly is gelatin? It's cooked collagen. And that's why we make bone broth, because the bones and the skin and the cartilage are high in collagen. And by cooking these bones and cartilage and skin in an acidulated water, or water that we've added some form of acid to, helps to leach out all of that collagen and cook it, and then we have a gelatinous bone broth. Now the perfect temperature to cook bone broth at, if you're doing it in a slow cooker or on the stovetop, is 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And the reason is that if you go higher than 180 degrees Fahrenheit, it can cause some of the collagen to break down, in essence to be damaged, and then that affects the final product, the final level of gelatinous bone broth that you're able to achieve. However, the good news is, for shorter periods of time than you would cook the bone broth in a slow cooker or on the stovetop, the collagen can withstand slightly higher temperatures, as I said, for a shorter period of time. And that's where the Instant Pot comes in. Now traditionally, if you were making a poultry-based bone broth, by today's standards, you would cook this for six hours in your slow cooker or six hours on the stovetop. Now, People used to do this for 24, 48, 72 hours, but since then, uh, scientific studies have been done, and I'll link to some books below where you can learn more about this, and they found that six hours for poultry bone broth is really sufficient to extract the majority of collagen out of the bones and without damaging any collagen, which sometimes long extended cooking times, even at that 180 degrees Fahrenheit, can cause some of the gelatin, the collagen, the cooked, the gelatin being the cooked collagen, to begin to break down. So six hours on the stovetop, six hours in the slow cooker, but only two hours in the Instant Pot. And that's where a really important tip comes in. As I said, we want to do two hours only in the Instant Pot, and we want to set it on low pressure. Now, low pressure is at a temperature of 233 degrees Fahrenheit. And as I mentioned earlier, the bones, the cartilage, the skin, they all contain collagen and different types of collagen. And much of this collagen is able to withstand that higher temperature of 233 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for the shorter period of time. So, that said, you should be able to get a nice gel from your bone broth made in the Instant Pot following those directions, low pressure and two hours. Now, in my experience, it's not going to be as gelatinous as what you might get in your slow cooker or your stovetop, but it's still going to gel nicely. And my attitude about all of this when it comes to bone broth is it's better to be making bone broth, whether in a longer situation, like with a slow cooker or the stovetop, or a shorter situation, like in, in the Instant Pot. It's just good to be making bone broth. So sacrificing a little bit of gel for saving on time is well worth it 
when you're in a rush. Now I'm using an eight quart duo plus, a little music when you take the lid off. And you can also do this in a six quart. That's fine too. And yes, you do want to take the rack out. Now, one thing I want to mention about the liner is uh, whether you have the eight quart or the six quart, all you can do when you use the pressure option is to fill it two thirds full. And there is a mark inside of here uh, that says PC max, pressure cook max, two thirds. So just be aware of that. And the reason that I wanted to mention that is right now for this particular batch of bone broth, I just have two carrots, a little bit of celery, one onion. I don't have the usual larger amount of vegetables that I add when I make bone broth in a slow cooker or on the stovetop. And the reason is I want to see exactly how much I can fit in. We can always add more vegetables once we get all of the uh, turkey scraps in and see how much room we have. Alrighty, well now I'm just going to go ahead and get all of this into my Instant Pot liner. Well, I've got all my bones and my turkey scraps in the liner and it's filled about halfway full. So we're in good shape. Now I want to say a word about chicken feet. Whenever I make chicken bone broth, I usually have uh, three chicken carcass from roast chickens if I'm doing it in the slow cooker or on the stovetop, and I usually have two a chicken carcass if I'm doing it in the Instant Pot. And I always like to add some chicken feet to ensure an extra gelatinous bone broth. So I'm going to go ahead and add in some chicken feet uh, to all of my scraps. And this was a 12 pound turkey. So in terms of relating that to chickens, maybe that were four pounds each, four, eight, 12, that would be three chicken carcass. And so I'm going to put in six feet three chickens, six feet. <laughs> and this is just one turkey. Now don't worry if you don't have chicken feet. Uh, I've made bone broth, uh, poultry bone broth in the Instant Pot with and without chicken feet and it's going to come gelatinous either way. Uh, but if you are able to find chicken feet, they're a wonderful thing to have on hand. And I've re received a lot of questions about chicken feet. Um, you can find them uh, at the grocery store. I've seen them at my little grocery store in the small town that I live in. And many of you have told me that you can find them at Walmart. And something I thought that was very cute was they're called chicken paws. <laughs> that just gave me such a tickle. But uh, you can also buy them online. And uh, I've purchased these from US Wellness Meats. And if you ever buy anything online like that, uh, they sell you know, meat and bones and chicken feet and chickens, all kinds of things. Um, if you do decide to go look at their website, be sure to check the description uh, underneath my video because I have a 15% discount code that helps with the saving, you know, helps with a nice little savings. But uh, also look at your farmer's market because I have seen them at my farmer's market. Um, they're very reasonable at the grocery store and at Walmart, uh, but they're not necessarily from pastured chickens. Uh, uh, from U.S. Wellness Meats and from your farmer's market, you're probably going to be able to find them, uh, the chicken feed from chickens that were from, you know, raised on pasture. Now these chicken feet have been all cleaned up. Uh, if you, depending on where you buy them, they may still have somewhat of a little yellow skin on them. Uh, then you'll want to clean that yellow skin off yourself. Um, but all you need to do is just dip them in boiling water uh, for a few seconds basically, and then just peel that uh, yellow skin off. It should come off relatively easily. And another thing that some of you have asked me about are the, the claws. You can cut them off or leave them on. It's really a personal choice. So I'm going to go ahead and add these feet right in there. Next, as I had shared earlier, I've just got some celery, carrots, onions. Uh, really, it's your choice how much you want to add, how much you can fit in. Uh, you don't have to peel anything and uh, really leaving the onion skins on is exceptionally helpful uh, because not only does it add color and flavor, onion skins, onion skins contain a lot of nutrition. Uh, so be sure to just put your onions in whole, skins and all. And now I'm going to go ahead and just add in all of these veggies. So the carrots are unpeeled. Uh, for the celery, I've kind of got the piece down at the bottom. Uh, that, these are very good things to use, you know, when you're sort of like cleaning out your crisper, so to speak. Uh, the vegetables don't need to look perfect. Those are the ones that are perfect for making bone broth. Alrighty, well we are getting close to that two-thirds mark. I think this is just going to be the perfect <laughs> amount of uh, vegetables to add. 
Finally, all I'm going to add in are a couple of bay leaves. You know me, I love to add the bay leaves to bone broth. And then I've just got a little small handful of black peppercorns. Next, we want to add some sort of acid because this is what's going to help leach that collagen out of the bones and the cartilage and the skin. And I like to use a fortified wine. I like to use white vermouth. And now you can use any kind of white wine you want, but I generally don't have a regular white wine, you know, with a cork and a nice bottle and all of that on hand. So I like keeping the fortified wines on hand. They're the ones that are um, made uh, in more or less with sugar and then are uh, just have a screw top on them. And it's very easy to keep them in the pantry and they last. They won't get an off flavor the way a bottle of wine would if once you uncork it and you know put it in your pantry for months. So that's why I like like to use fortified wines but you can use regular wine and if you don't want to use any alcohol you can use apple cider vinegar now if you do choose to use apple cider vinegar you're going to want to go with no more than a quarter of a cup because more than that may impart a bit of a strong flavor to your final finished bone broth product and some of you have asked me if you can use lemon juice yes you certainly can use lemon juice and you'll just want to experiment a little as to how much lemon, how much lemon juice you like, uh, because again, that will also affect the taste of the end product, the final bone broth product. But to start with, I probably wouldn't add any more lemon juice than what you can get from one large lemon. So I'm going to go ahead and add in this white vermouth. Now our final addition is going to be water. And the nice thing about making bone broth in the Instant Pot is it's really difficult to add too much water because we can't go past that two-thirds uh, line in the liner and that's basically going to be just enough water what we add in to cover the contents. And too much water is really the enemy of bone broth if you're trying to achieve something that's gelatinous. Now, if you cook it correctly and the gelatin is not damaged, that it's completely fine, uh, but your bone broth still didn't gel, chances are it was just too much water and the gelatin has been diluted. Now it's still very nutritious and you'll still want to drink it, but if you're drinking it for that gelatin, you'll just need to drink more. And I just want to say one more thing about all of this bone broth and gelatin and this, that, and the other thing is that some of you have shared with me that, oh no, you cooked it way too high and way too long and it was came out watery and so on and so forth. Don't worry. Even if you don't get the perfect gel on your bone broth and you feel like you made a lot of mistakes in making it, don't throw it out. I know some of you have said, oh, I threw it out. It's still nutritious. It still is rich in protein. It still has all of the minerals from the vegetables that you added. So it's still okay and it's, it's still good to drink and it's still nutritious. So now we'll just go and, whoops, I'm <laughs> splashing. Fill this with water up to the two-thirds mark. Now don't worry if everything isn't exactly submerged under the water, it's going to be fine. I'll take a picture and I'll overlay it so you can see how mine looks inside my liner. Uh, the bottom line is you just don't want to go over that two-thirds uh, fill line. Now something that I like to do at this point, and it's really not required, especially if you want to get this done in two hours, uh, I like to let this sit now and soak in the acidulated water for one hour. And the reason that I like to do that is I feel it gives the acidulated water in combination uh, with the bones and the cartilage and the skin, so on and so forth, a little bit of a head start. It allows the leaching process to begin. It allows the acidulated water to begin to leach out the collagen from those bones and scraps. But as I said, that's not required. That's just a little something that I like to do. And if you've got the time, you can do it you're still going to get a gelatinous bone broth if you go right away into turning on the pressure. Now we'll get ready to put the lid on, but before we do, if you're new to working with the Instant Pot, I just want to mention something about this pressure release valve. 
I'll overlay a picture so you can see this up closely, uh, but it has two options, venting and sealing. Now for pressure cooking, we're going to have that on sealing. And if you've never worked with the pressure release valve before, it really moves very easily. It's slightly, it's a little higher, slightly higher on venting and slightly lower on sealing. It's not a big click, it's not like it's locking into place, nothing like that. And I just wanted to share that with you if you are a beginner, because I know when I first started working with the Instant Pot, I expected it to really make a big click and lock in place. No, doesn't do any of that. Very easy, easily, it turns very easily. And as I said, it's a little higher on venting and a little lower on sealing. So we want to just make sure that once we get our lid locked in place, we have it on sealing. Now when you put the lid down, it'll make a little music. When you lock it into place, it'll make a little music. And then we want to make sure we've got our vent, our pressure release valve on uh, sealing. And then we want to come over here and I, I have a duo, you know, an eight-quart duo. And so mine says pressure cook, Your, yours may say manual. Um, I'm going to uh, choose pressure cook. And then mine right now is set for only four minutes. So I've got to turn this up for two hours. And in doing that, I'm going to be using the plus button. And now the pressure level is on high. So I'm going to press this pressure level button and turn it to low. And now we're all set. This will automatically click in and start pressurizing and making our bone broth. There we go. Now while this is cooking, I want to mention one thing about the pressure valve. If you have one of the very new Instant Pots, they're changing the way the pressure valve is designed. And I believe that it may automatically uh, lock into the sealing option when you're pressure cooking. And then there are some different options on how you do your pressure release. So just be aware of that, that it, your pressure valve may look different than what I shared with you. Uh, but I'll overlay a picture of what the new one looks like, uh, just so that you don't get confused. And another piece of information I want to share with you is on my lid, the pressure indicator button is red. On some, it may be silver. But what's important to know about that is when your Instant Pot comes up to pressure, that little button raises. And at the end when it's done cooking and whether you let the pressure come down naturally or you do a quick release, that little button will lower indicating that it's no longer under, that the Instant Pot is no longer under pressure. And another thing I wanted to mention about how I learned about all of this and uh, making bone broth in the Instant Pot, cooking it on low, cooking it for two hours, all of that, is that I like to call the Instant Pot customer service line whenever I start a project in the Instant Pot. There is a lot of information online from various people who are experimenting with it and whatnot. There's even information on the Instant Pot website and there's information on the manual that comes with your Instant Pot. But I have found that speaking with the people on their customer service line, that I learn a lot that's not included in the website or in an information book. Uh, it's just from their personal experience because many of them take classes, I guess maybe offered through the company or whatnot, and they do a lot of experimentation and they see what works and what they like and so on and so forth. And so I find you really can learn a lot uh, speaking to people who basically are very hands-on uh, every day with the Instant Pot. So whenever you have questions, I highly recommend that you give them a call. Uh, sometimes I've noticed now with the popularity of the Instant Pot, sometimes the wait can be a little longer, but it's often well worth it. Well, my Instant Pot cooked for two hours, and at that point it beeped, and then it automatically, in this particular model, switches to keep warm. Now when it comes to making bone broth in the Instant Pot, you can let it come down naturally uh, from pressure, or you can do the quick release. I've done it both ways, uh, because initially I was very afraid of the quick release, and so I let it come down to pressure naturally, and I did get a gelatinous bone broth, uh, but I've learned that by doing the quick release, you're going to get a more gelatinous bone broth. And I just want to share, if there's anybody out there who's like me, uh, when I do the quick release, I like to use a wooden spoon 
to move the pressure release, release valve because the steam really comes out quite uh, energetically. <laughs> and so I feel a little safer being a little farther away from it. So that's just my little tip. Well, now that the pressure has been released, we're ready to open it. And what I like to do is pull the lid toward me so that I'm opening it in terms of the steam coming out away from me. You'll hear the music. There we go. Well, this looks fabulous and I'll overlay a picture so that you can see it. Now what we want to do is basically start to strain out all the solids. Now, once you've strained out all the solids, let them cool a little bit. And once you can look through them, see if you can find any bones that may still have cartilage on them or that are still fairly well intact. Now, you may find some cartilage like this. It'll be very jelly-like. I'll overlay a picture so that you can see that up close. That's definitely worth saving because it's not uh, uh, completely had all of its uh, collagen extracted out of it. And then these feet, the chicken feet, still look in quite good condition. There's a lot of nutrition that can still come out of this. So with these uh, gelatinous pieces of cartilage that you can find, and if you've used chicken feet or maybe some wings uh, that still look like they still have some nutrition to give off, just add these to any other scraps you may be keeping in your freezer, chicken scraps uh, or whatnot, or, or other turkey scraps. Keep them and then when you get ready to make a second batch of turkey bone broth or chicken bone broth for that matter, you can add these in and try to extract the last bits of nutrition from them. Now I know some of you have asked me, well Mary, if these are still good, why can't I just let this go in the Instant Pot for three or four hours until I've really extracted everything from these? And that's a great question. The problem is, Pretty much all of this has had everything extracted from it and you've got a nice bone broth made. And if you try to push what's made and in good condition, so to speak, uh, something that will be gelatinous once refrigerated, you might push it to the point where what you've made that's, not, that's been extracted and is doing well, you may push that to the point of breaking, for lack of a better word, of becoming damaged, allowing your gelatin to become damaged by the extended time just to get the little bit that may be left in here. The better thing to do is just fish out those pieces that look like they're still intact and add those to, and you can put these right back into the freezer, whatever the case may be, wherever you keep your scraps uh, based on how soon you're going to make another uh, batch of bone broth. Just add these in, put them in, and then that way, when they go for the second batch, you'll extract what's left from them, but you won't have damaged your first batch. And there's one more thing I wanna say about chicken feet, because this is to do with a question that I get asked a lot. Can these be added when you make beef bone broth? And yes, you can add these to your beef bone broth. These will help give you a nice gelatinous beef bone broth. They won't give a chicken flavor. The beef flavor will be strong enough to overpower it. And they're a nice substitute if you can't find your more high cartilage bones like your oxtails or your neck bones or the patellas um, and so on and so forth. The knuckle bones, those are other high cartilage bones. And if you can't find those and say all you can find is maybe marrow bones and a few shanks uh, for the beefy meaty flavor, add in some chicken feet. You'll be all set. Now at this point you have a couple of options. You can transfer this to some sort of vessel that you want to put into your refrigerator. And then the next day, if you want, you can scoop the uh, turkey fat off the top and then you'll find your bone broth underneath, scoop all of that out, and any little debris that we weren't able to get out from using the wire whisk will have sunk to the bottom. And that's the easiest way to do this. But I actually like to take a few more steps so that by the time I put this in the refrigerator or the freezer, I'm putting in, an, in a clarified bone broth product. So what I like to do is get some kind of vessel. I'm just using a large glass measuring cup here so that you can see what I'm doing. And then over that, I put a little mesh strainer and then I take my mesh strainer and I line it with this flour sack towel. 
And you can also use cheesecloth, um, you know, whatever you have, just something that's very thin. You might be able to use the uh, coffee filters. I've never really tried that. These flower sack towels work great. And I just want to mention, I'll, I'll put links to all of this, including the fat separator, which we'll talk about in a minute that I get a lot of questions about. I'll put that all, I'll put them all in the description below, but be sure to check your grocery store or local, local kitchen store because they carry most of this stuff. Then all I like to do is take this bone broth and just ladle it into my vessel through all of this filtration setup. And then I will show you all the little bits and bobs that it catches um, to help clarify it. So you'll see this is all the debris that I'm catching. I'll over overlay a picture so you can see it up closely. Now if you had just refrigerated it as is, that would sink to the bottom. However, there would be, it would be in somewhat of a, a gelatin, sort of looking like an aspic with little bits of, of debris in it. And so if you discarded that, you'd also be discarding some of the bone broth with it. So I like to make sure that I get as much bone broth out of this as possible. So that's why I take this step. Now, if you wanted, you could refrigerate it at this point and the fat would rise to the top and you would have your bone broth underneath. And then you could remove the, the fat from the top and save that for cooking or whatever the case may be. And then you would have a completely clarified bone broth. The other option is you just leave the fat on it and mix that in when you warm up your bone broth. Some people like that. I prefer to use the fat to cook with and to drink a clarified bone broth if I'm gonna use it as a sipping broth. And that brings me to a, another question I get a lot. How exactly do you consume this? And if you want to keep the fat on top, you would just keep, scoop out some of the fat and the broth and put it into a saucepan, as you know, whatever amount you want, warm it gently, add a little sea salt. You can pour it into a coffee mug and just enjoy it as a lovely sipping broth. If you want the fat removed, then yes, you would, you know, let it chill, remove the fat, and then just scoop out your bone broth, put it in a saucepan, warm it gently, and add a little sea salt if you like, and enjoy it as a nice sipping broth. That's one way to use bone broth. Now, what I like to do, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I like to finish up and do everything right now and have the most clarified uh, bone broth I can get that I then go to put in the freezer or the refrigerator. So I like to use this fat separator. This thing is amazing. It, you put your bone broth in here that still has the fat in it. This has a little hole in the bottom and it's got a little lever here. And all we do is pour our bone broth in, the fat will float to the top, and then we press this lever and we decant our bone broth into whatever vessel we're using to save it. So I'll go ahead and show you how I do that. Now once you pour your bone broth in this, as I mentioned, the fat will rise to the top. It's right up here. I'll take a close-up picture so you can see that. Not too much fat, but enough that I'm happy to be able to decant it fat-free. And But don't worry, I don't throw out that fat. I do save it and cook with it. Because I know many of you have said to me in some of the other bone broth videos, oh my gosh, don't throw out the fat, it's good for you. <laughs> and I don't worry, I save it. Um, so now what I like to do is for things like turkey bone broth and chicken bone broth, I tend to use those a lot more for cooking than I do sipping. I tend to sip more the beef bone broth. So if you've seen some of my other videos, I usually put the beef bone broth in a big half gallon jar and put that right in my fridge because my husband and I will drink that within a few days. Uh, but for the chicken bone broth or the turkey bone broth, I like to store it in one cup or two cup measures. And then when I have a recipe that calls for chicken broth or turkey broth, whatever the case may be, uh, or even water, I'll use this. So that's well, one way, a uh, number of ways that you can use your bone broth to make soups and stews, to make rice, to make grains. Whenever something calls for water, just substitute it with bone broth. It adds wonderful nutrition. And I have a video where I talk about all the different ways you can use bone broth. And you can even add this to smoothies and you won't even notice it. And I discuss that in more detail in the other video, which I'll link to the iCards and in the description below. I think you'll find that very interesting. But in any event, so now all I do is go ahead and store this in my jar. Now, this is a glass jar, yes. And I am gonna put this in the freezer. 
but this is a very wide mouth type jar, as you can tell. And actually, I think they're called French working glasses or French jelly jars, something like that. They're not canning jars. I'm not a fan of using canning jars in the freezer. I know some of you have said you've had luck with wide mouth canning jars and some of you haven't. Some of you have had breakage and whatnot. And the reason that I like these is what I'll do is I'll decant enough, but to leave a good inch headspace. And then these have little plastic lids. Let me move this out of the way. And I'll just put this plastic lid on and I'll pop this in the freezer. Now, I've left a good amount of headspace. I'm not going to have a problem, but say I didn't leave a good enough amount of headspace. All that'll happen, it's just, it'll just, the, the broth as it expands, as it freezes, will just push this plastic lid off. No fanfare, no broken glass, everything works great. Now I'm also going to decant a little bit of this bone broth into here. And I'm going to go ahead and put this in the refrigerator and let it chill so we can see what level of gelatinousness <laughs> we achieved. Look at all this glorious turkey bone broth that we have. And to think that this just came from some scraps and a carcass that might have otherwise been thrown out. I love this. And then I've got some wonderful turkey fat to cook with. Now let's see how gelatinous this came. Oh, it looks wonderful. And I'll overlay a picture so that you can see it, but it looks fantastic. Well, if you'd like more Instant Pot recipes, be sure to click on this video over here, where I show you how to cook a whole chicken in the Instant Pot the right way, and how to make a wonderful creamy mac and cheese. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.